Hey, North Coast, Chris here. I hope you are off to an amazing weekend. Hey, we wanted to get ahead of you on some questions you may have because of uh, what a president said yesterday. Uh, two things, number one, I love it. Anytime any government official, especially a president of any country, um, says, hey, houses of worship are essential and they should be open. They are foundational to our society, because I agree with that. Secondly, his statements and comments meant absolutely nothing for our time frame here at North Coast. I know some of you started to call and email. Hey, the president said churches are open and he'll override the governor. What the president said is churches should be open according to the CDC's regulations and guidelines. I just want you to know here in San Diego County, um, we've already been on that path. Churches can open according to the CDC guidelines and that's the critical thing. What does that mean? That means no children's ministry, no kids gathering. That means no worship projecting of voices out loud. That means health screenings at the door. That means posters of signs saying no one over the age of 65, no one with pre-existing conditions. That also means that every other row has to be left open. So we're down to 50% occupancy. And in those rows that are seated, social distancing. So about 10 people for every row of 20, we're cut in half again. We're down to about 20% of what we can fit in normal of our buildings. You realize we do 60 services a weekend. If we try to multiply that by five to make up for those amount of seats we've lost, we've got to do 300 services a weekend. People, it's just not gonna happen. And on top of that, what we've learned from all of our brother and sister churches in, in Texas and in Oklahoma that have been open for a couple weeks is, this is not just a really lousy program and product you're putting out. The people are resoundingly saying, this doesn't feel like church. This isn't good. We're all sitting with masks on, no one can touch, everyone's apart, no singing, no children, or your children have to sit with you, that this isn't good. The last thing I wanna be is behind a drum shield for about 20% of people that are having a not good time in church. We're the opposite of not good times in church. One of the other things we've learned is those churches that are trying to open are coming up with some major difficulties. You've probably seen the news. You've probably seen the Catholic Church in Houston where the priest died of a lung disease. Come to find out four of his staff have tested positive for COVID-19 and five of his parishioners. So that church has been shut down. Or the church up here in what is it, Oroville, Northern California that opened for Mother's Day. They had someone tested positive. They've had to quarantine. Everyone that was in the church service had to stay at home, not leave their house for 14 days. And and we're seeing more and more of these. These aren't gonna be isolated cases. We're just not in a hurry to jump on this. Yesterday, I met with another family here at North Coast that lost their mom to COVID-19. The tragedy of losing a mom was one thing, not being able to be with her, not being able to see her, not being able to be present by the bedside is another. And in a church our size, we just have way too many of those stories. I'm glad that when you guys heard this a couple weeks ago, almost unanimously, overwhelmingly, you said, that's us, that's our church. You can close buildings, you can't close the bride. We wanna meet at homes. We wanna do this in the right way. I love that we have a congregation that carries more, cares more about the community than the congregation. Why are we in a rush to get together and have 20% occupancy in a bad service? And what is that showing the people that drive by? I guarantee you, the community that we always say we love, they're not driving by going, I wish that church would put a lot of people in those buildings. No, they're driving by going, why in the world are they opening their doors at this time? They said for years they love us, then why are they doing this to our community? And I love that North Coast, you care more about the community and what they think than what a congregation thinks. I love that you're just gonna back up everything we've talked about for years and years now. We will welcome people on the weekends to these buildings, say, hey, thanks for coming. If you're here on the weekend, you're part of the crowd. If you ever wanna be part of the church, join a life group. Church happens in homes, not in buildings. Church happens in circles, not in rows. Church happens where there's dialogue, not just in this monologue. We're more excited than ever for the next few months for small group gatherings to open in homes, for churches to happen in communities all across North County and beyond, for you to invite friends or life groups or neighbors or peoples and sit there, peoples, peoples, more than one people, and to sit there and to have church together, to really connect where people can't get drive in, get lost in the crowd and drive back out, but they have to sit in the living room and have some small talk. North Coast, thanks for getting this. Thanks for understanding this. I love that we're in a country where we still have leaders that say churches are essential, open them. How they open and when they open are what we are taking really seriously. Thanks for understanding. Thanks for your support. Thanks for being the coolest congregation that cares not just about what we do, but what we do, what it says to those out there. That's one more way you're loving the community around us. Love you guys. 
Hey everybody, Kirk here. Thanks so much for inviting us into your homes today. Before we get started, wanted to remind you that the Digital Bulletin, which you can find in our app and our website, is the best place to get everything you need for our weekend service. Take sermon notes, tithe, you can even fill out a communication card. You're definitely gonna wanna check it out before we get started. Also wanted to remind you that it's Memorial Day weekend, which means we pause to remember those who came before us and those who we lost fighting for our freedoms. Our creative team got a chance to ask a Navy chaplain exactly what it means to serve God and serve country. This was his response. This morning, as I walk the sacred grounds that is our national cemetery, I'm reminded of the words of Jesus when he said, greater love has no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. As a Navy chaplain, I've had the great privilege and honor of serving God and serving our nation by helping young men and women who wear the cloth of our nation to connect with the living hope that they have in Jesus Christ. That when this body dies, that life keeps going. But these young men and women who wear the cloth of our nation, they sign a blank check to our country, up to and including their lives. And in every season, and every generation, that bill comes due. And those that pay the ultimate sacrifice this weekend and every day, we honor their legacy. May we never forget. For the men and women who are currently serving our country and who have served in the past, we thank you. And for the families who've lost a loved one, you're in our prayers and we honor you not just this weekend, but every day. Right now, we're gonna head into the edge and hear another great worship set from Brandon Camilo. Brandon is our worship leader at our Palma Valley campus. And when this quarantine is up, there are so many reasons why you're gonna to wanna to check that place out. Number one, it's our newest campus. Number two, it offers one of our smaller, more intimate venues, which means it's probably gonna open up a lot sooner than this place does. Number three, it is our only church building. And it doesn't just have one steeple, it has two. And number four, it's got amazing worship like this. Hey church, I'm Brandon Camilo from North Coast Palma Valley. We'd like to invite you to come and worship with us today.
Hey church, it's important to remember in times like these, when the enemy is fighting as hard as they can to gain a foothold on our lives and in our world, that our God is always victorious in the end. Jesus paid it all so that we could spend an eternity by his side. So in response to that incredible love that he's shown us, let's worship him and let's acknowledge that death has been defeated and that he has won. Good to see you guys again. We are in the book of Acts chapter 7 today as we continue in this, this cut scene back in time to what, to what Stephen's talking about. Stephen is trying to give the members of the Sanhedrin, I'm going to give you guys a visual of what Stephen was standing in front of. So I'm going to pull it up right here. Uh, the accused would stand right here. So we've got our character, Stephen, and then you've got 70 members of the Jewish council all around here and then the high priest standing right in front of him. And in the middle of all of this craziness, Stephen is giving this long lecture that's essentially catching them up in the story, but they would have been familiar with the story, right? They knew the Jewish Old Testament. They knew all these stories. But Stephen in particular is trying to connect all the craziness of what's happened with the person of Jesus. Trying to help them understand that everything that has happened has been pointing to Jesus Christ. As Jews, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah they've been waiting for. So 
Stephen is kind of giving this apologetics, this, this long drawn out explanation of how Jesus is the fulfillment of all these things. And one of the ways that he does that is by examining the different epochs in Israel's history. The first one being the age of the patriarchs, which we talked about with Chris last week, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob then has 12 sons. And there's a significant story in the middle of here about a man named Joseph. Kind of the second epoch is where they're in this this promised land, if you will, and they begin to grow in numbers because of a very important story that we're going to jump back to Genesis to look at, but we're going to start in Acts chapter 7. Here's the cut scene. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. I guess cut scene was, <laughs> cut scene was um, no pun intended. And Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day after his birth. The circumcision was a symbol of God's covenant with his chosen people, Israel. It was an external way of showing for the men and the families that their family was going to follow Yahweh and not the other pagan gods around them. Later, Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob became the father of 12 patriarchs. Okay, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, Judah, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, uh, Benjamin, Zebulun, and Benjamin. There's all of these sons of Jacob and all 12 of them are going, are going to be the fathers of the 12 nations of Israel. It's, it's going to make more sense when we get to the, the Davidic kingdom and the monarchy that Israel's moving into. But right now, the epoch that they're in is Abraham. He was promised to be the father of many. He then gives birth to Isaac, Isaac down to Jacob. Jacob then has 12 sons. And scripture zooms in the story in particular of this son named Joseph. Here's what it says. Because the patriarchs, the 12, were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all of his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So Pharaoh made him ruler over all of Egypt and all of his palace. But then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan bringing great suffering, and our ancestors couldn't find any food. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers on their first visit. And on their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. When we go back, this whole story, if you're not familiar with it, will make more sense. After this, Joseph sent for his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. Then Jacob went down to Egypt, where he and his ancestors died. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had brought, has bought from his sons of Hamor at Shechem for a certain sum of money. So Stephen is talking about this Jesus character and he feels like he can't properly tell the story of Jesus without including the story of Joseph. And one of the things that the life of Joseph and Jesus had in common, and there's a lot, the theological term for Joseph is that Joseph is a type of Christ. What we mean by that is he's a foreshadowing or an illustration of a lot of the life of what Jesus did. And Jesus is always the better. Jesus is the better Joseph, right? Jesus is the better Abraham. Abraham was a great father. Jesus is a better father, right? Abraham was a great man of faith. Jesus was a greater man of faith. And the scripture constantly wants us to remember that all the stories in the Old Testament are pointing to Jesus. And a very important one that points to Jesus is the story of Joseph. And the story goes in summary, it says this in Genesis chapter 37, if you want to flip back to the beginning of your Bible, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This was the land given to Abraham and his descendants. This is the account of Jacob's family. Joseph was a young man, 17-year-old dude. So Joseph is a 17-year-old dude, and it says that he is the beloved son of his father, Abraham, or the, a beloved son of his father, Jacob. And so Jacob loves him. He was the only son born to this is kind of a weird part of Israel's past, Abra or, uh, Jacob's favorite wife, okay? Now, again, you might go, so polygamy was okay in the Old Testament? <laughs> no. If you read the stories of people who practice polygamy, their lives were disaster. So this is a place where the scripture is telling us a story, not prescribing what we ought to do, right? Just so we might tell a story of someone who made a really bad decision. We're not explaining to people how to live their life. 
So it's describing this imperfect group of people. And that's the whole Bible. The whole Bible is imperfect people who carry out ultimately the perfect will of God, which is to save his people from their sins that we may know Jesus and be with him forever. Joseph, this beloved son, maybe you have this kid in your family, the, the one that everyone loves the most, right? He's like the, the fa- father, or, t- or he's like the teacher's pet, like for your parents, he's your parents' favorite kid. And you, they just get along the best and they like them the best. And sometimes it's obvious, right? It's normally the oldest child in my family. Uh, I'm the middle child. I'm the forgotten one, right? You know what I'm talking about? People, go with me on this one. Just kidding. I had an awesome parents, awesome childhood. But typically, Almost every family has that joke of, oh, they're the favorite child. Well, this seemed to be pretty real. What we find out is Joseph was born to, again, uh, Jacob's favorite wife. And then Jacob goes so far as to give him this multicolored robe, this beautiful, ornate robe. And he, it's kind of a symbol of how much he liked Joseph. So they, his brothers, who are all older than him, already don't like the guy. They already think he's kind of scum because dad likes him so much, right? It it naturally breeds that contempt. And then Joseph walks up one day with no intelligence and no wisdom and says, brothers, I had a dream. I had a dream that one day you would all bow down to me. (laughs) Isn't that crazy? What a crazy dream. And he walks on. His brothers get so disgusted with him that they're going to eventually have an argument on what to do with him. And they finally are convinced, here's what we'll do. We'll throw him down in a pit and leave him there. And we'll make it look like he was killed by wild dogs or something like, something like that. So they take the robe and they dip it in blood and they give it back to their father and they say, look, Joseph was killed. Well, then they have a bright idea. Well, let's not just leave him in this pit. Let's sell him into slavery. At least we can get some money for this kid. So they sell Joseph into slavery in Egypt and Joseph now is off on this journey where he goes into a land that he's unfamiliar with and, and he was cocky and pompous and self-righteous and thought he was the chosen, the chosen child. He, had, he was gonna do all, all these great things. Now he finds himself in chains. He is sold to a a high-ranking official named Potiphar and he's scrubbing floors and he's doing dishes and he's doing all these slave tasks at that day and age. And one day, Potiphar's wife finds him very attractive. She comes up to Joseph and tries to woo him to get to sleep with her. And Joseph rightfully runs away, runs the whole other direction. And as he runs the other direction, Potiphar's wife gets embarrassed going, what, you ran away from me? So he accu- she accuses Joseph of actually being the aggressor. He then gets put into jail, into prison for doing the right thing. Scripture makes it very clear to flee from sexual immorality. And this is where the story all throughout scripture gets crazy. Don't we think to ourselves, as long as I do what God says, it's always gonna be in my best interest and it's always gonna work out for the good. It's always gonna make things better and things are gonna be comfortable and safe and Nerf ball and bubble wrapped as long as I do what God says. And right here, Joseph did exactly what he was commanded to do to run away and he finds himself in prison for a long, long, long time until Pharaoh has a dream and he doesn't know what to do with the dream. Well, we've already seen before that Joseph is a great interpreting dreams. So he's brought up because someone else who used to be in the dungeon with him says, I actually know a guy who can interpret dreams. Let's bring Joseph out of the dungeon, brings him out of the dungeon and Joseph says, Pharaoh, tell me your dreams. Imagine how nervous Joseph might've been. I mean, if you tell the Pharaoh the wrong thing, it's just a, it's a slave's life. It's just a snap of the fingers. And in that day and age, you were just property. You could be gone just like that. Joseph properly interprets the dream saying that there's gonna be seven years of plenty in Egypt followed by seven years of famine. And he says, in the seven years of plenty, everyone's gonna eat and drink and have their fill. But if you're smart, Pharaoh, you're gonna store up during that period of time, make big storehouses full of grain, And when that time comes, you'll go from being this kind of podunk city of Egypt to the greatest empire, perhaps, that ever was. So Pharaoh listens to him and he trusts him. And in seven years of plenty, they build big storehouses and they don't eat over their fill. And then when the rest of the entire known world at the time falls into a deep drought and a deep famine, guess where everyone has to turn? They go to Egypt and because of Joseph, they're selling off their possessions. They sell everything they have, they have to Egypt and Egypt almost overnight goes into this swell of a country that becomes so a powerful empire all because of Joseph's influence 
on Pharaoh. But anywhere in the middle of that story, imagine being Joseph. Imagine being this kid who you went, but I'm trying to, I'm doing the right thing and I find myself in slavery and then I'm doing the right thing and I found myself in a pit and I'm doing the right thing and I run away from Potiphar's wife and then I find myself in the dungeon and I'm doing the right thing and I'm there for years and years and years and then I'm doing the right thing and it keeps going the wrong way. And so we ask this of our life, God, are you just, are you gone? Are you done with me? Have you just moved on to someone else? Are you listening? Are you there? Are you present? Even when I'm doing the right thing, it seems like my life doesn't work out the way that I want it to. And oftentimes I think uh, our life, the plan that God has for our life, we might think it's this beautiful connect the dot. One to two to three to four to five. And you make this perfect square, this perfect triangle or this perfect hexagon of a life. And it's detailed and it's ornate and it's planned out and it's chronological and it's unilateral and everything is perfectly well drawn. But almost anyone who walks with Jesus for any period of time, when you tell them to start telling their story, it looks a lot more like this. One step forward, two steps back, over here. What the heck happened here? You lost your friend. You lost this. It went here. You lost all your money. You then found this period of success. And then you went here. And the story they're telling isn't uniform. It's not clean. It, it's not simple. It's not, it, it, it doesn't move in one direction oftentimes, even when we obey. Even though most of our trouble, if we're honest, comes from us not obeying. So if you have your note sheet, we're going to look at how my plan tends to look versus how God's plan for me tends to look. Before this sermon is over, you are going to get to experience Legos and diagrams and neat stuff. So tune in. If you want to bring the kids in, we're going to have a really cool section where we talk about building Legos. uh, If you want to invite them into the conversation too. This first section, how, do, how does my way work versus the way that God's way tends to work? My way, first of all, it's very progressive, right? It's very from here, like I said, connect the dots. From here to here, it's numbered. I can see where it would go. I want to get this job someday, so I need to start by doing well in high school. And then I want to go off to this trade school or off to college. And I'm going to do well there. And that's where I'll find my wife. And then after I find my wife, we'll get married. And then we'll begin an internship. And that internship will turn into a job offer. That job offer will turn into a new 401k. That 401k will offer me all the safety of life. And then we'll have about 60 years of pure marital bliss with as many kids as we choose. And then life will be over. I'll turn in my key card and I'll retire into the arms of heavenly, of our heavenly father. And that's kind of how we draw our life, right? One leads to the next, leads to the last. It's very progressive. And you see how this part gets to this part, gets to this part. And oftentimes when it comes to God, his way is much more confusing for us. He sees the end from the beginning and all things in between. And God's on this refining mission in our life. And instead of it being progressive, sometimes his plan looks regressive. We're going, well, God, I was going this way, but then you brought me back here and you walked me through it again. And then you brought me back here and you walked me here, right? God promises Abraham the promised land. And yet in a couple of generations, the Egyptians have taken his people, the Israelites captive, And then after they're freed from slavery, they wander in the desert for 40 years. And you're saying, well, why can't we just go directly to the promised land? And God says, I've got a bigger story that I'm telling. My way looks obvious. My way, it's not just, it's not just progressive, but it's obvious. Anyone who looks at my story would go, that's the next logical step. That's the next logical step. I see how these things fit together. I just want to get where I want to go. But in the middle of God's plan, it's much more subtle we find ourselves crying out saying, God, are you still here? What are you doing? How are are you at work in the middle of this craziness? Sometimes our, uh, our plans are external. We get kudos, we get a raise, we get a pay increase, tangible things, we watch our bank account increase. It's very external. Our our plans have to do with growing this and growing that and uplifting this. And we can win medals for it and we can get promotions for it and we can get more money for it and we can get the, the standing applause and we can get, it's very external. Whereas God's plan for us has almost strictly to do with internal things, a spiritual maturity growth in relationships, in our marriages, in our, in our connectedness, in our friendships, in our church communities. God's will for our life is rarely external and far more internal. It's far more relational than it is rational. 
We want to focus on temporal things, right? We want to store up the treasure and store up the, the grain houses to make sure we have plenty to make sure that our life lived here is well spent and that our next 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years are very comfortable, whereas God's concern is far more with eternal things. Not how you're going to spend the next 30 years, but the next 30 billion years. That's where God's emphasis lies in our, his plan for our lives. My way is instant, right? My way is like an iPhone picture, right? You all line up and I go, all right, everyone, get in. Okay, smush in. No, I can't see this side of the plant. Thank you. And click. And then what do you do? You instantly turn around and go, oh, good picture, right? That was a good one. Okay, now a funny one, right? Why do I always do the funny one? I don't know. But we're able to see it instantly. We're able to see the image come about to fruition instantly. And God's much more of an old school photographer. Yet the picture is taken. God knows what it's going to come out as. But then we spend a season maybe in a dark room and getting developed and developed and developed. And if you open the door to the dark room, you're going to overexpose the film. It's not, it's not your time. It's not ready. God develops us slowly in a process until his image is built on us. He's much more patient where we want to be much more instant. Our life, my way, seems to be cushioned. I want a cushion. Again, I want the bubble wrap. I want the Nerf ball. And God looks a lot more like football. I want the Nerf life. And God's like, I want you in the huddle. I want you on the front lines. This might hurt, but it's all going to be used to refine you, to make you more like the image of God. And his will and his way, even if you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus followed God's will perfectly, which included his betrayal, his execution, his humiliation, crucifixion, but ultimately the story of Jesus is our redemption story. His is much more a refined, refining process, whereas we might want it to be more cushioned. But in the middle of it, we look at this and we think to ourselves, um, this is my life. And sometimes we go like, well, is my life supposed to be like this? God, do you want my life standing like this? Or, or, or on our own volition, we go, well, maybe you want to be laying down like this. Or maybe, oh, oh I, know, I know the purpose of my life. My life is, uh, it's, it's a right angle for people who are d d trying to create right, right angles. My life is for, my life is for, and this is why our life is so confusing, because as vessels of God's word and part of God's mission, we look at this single Lego piece and we go, what are you doing? And so sometimes in the middle of that, we just forfeit and we go, God, you're probably building something big and technical and bigger than who I am. Like in Joseph's case, he's going to create a legacy by which eventually all nations are going to have to come to Egypt, including Joseph's own family is going to come and beg for forgiveness. Joseph's brothers who sold him into slavery are going to come back and say, Joseph, we didn't know it was you. How did you come to this power of posi position of power in Egypt? We need food. We're starving. And because of everything in Joseph's life, he is able to supplement and able to save his own people. He's able to give them food where there would have been no food back in the land of Canaan because of that step-by-step -step obedience that he had. But when our life gets confusing, sometimes we throw the baby out with the bathwater and we say, God, I don't know what you're building, but I want my life to be something that makes a lot of sense. So we want to build something very simplistic, right? One of the most popular selling Lego sets of all time is the Millennium Falcon. And uh, there's actually a, it's, it's this massive set, 7,000 plus pieces. But that's complicated and it's big and it's extravagant and it's time consuming and it's step by step by step. Sometimes when we get in that kind of confusion, we want to take our own life in our own hands and go, God, I don't want to do what you want me to do. I want to be the architect of my own life. And when we do that, we're capable of building a Millennium Falcon too, but it just doesn't quite have the same gusto that God's does. Let me show you a picture of a very simple version of the Millennium Falcon that you might have. You might go, look, isn't this beautiful? It makes sense. I can tell you where this piece goes. It's right there. I need about three more pieces. I'll put it together myself. I don't need your instruction booklet. I don't need to follow you. I don't need to do things your way. My life, I'm just going to get rich or die trying. And I'm going to have the kids that I want and the picket fence that I want and the way that I want and avoid suffering and give into temptation because it feels good and it feels right. And I'm going to do things my way, regardless of yours, because I can't tell what you're building. 
and I want to build what I want to build. And okay, it's not great. It's not long lasting. It's not significant. It's not particularly valuable. This thing online is about $7, $11 on eBay is what I found it for, but originally retailed for less than that. But those of us who lean into the calling of God, we might say, God, I, (laughs) I don't get it. But then all of a sudden, we're able to read scripture and find out God is building something beyond our wildest dreams. To bring it into focus, there's a little bit of dark magic going on, but I'm gonna use the force and I'm gonna bring in what God's trying to build in the life of a believer. Are you ready? I know it's the Imperial March. I'm not very good at Star Wars, but here it comes. This. God's building a 7,541 piece Millennium Falcon. This is very different than the life that we might have built for ourselves. And in fact, if my life is just this, I'm not the Millennium Falcon. I'm just a piece on it. And I am supposed to go right here. What if I broke this? This would make for the best TV ever. Right here. See that piece? That's where I belong. That's my part on this bigger thing. But we take our lives in our hands and all, all God says, I just want you to be obedient. I just want you to build this thing step by step. Just read exactly what I want for your life. As the great theologian Elsa in Frozen 2 says, just do the next right thing with what you know. And maybe our life walking with Christ looks a lot more like Lego sets than we actually want to admit. And if you guys have been in quarantine for a while, like I have, we've spent a lot of time doing puzzles and a lot of time building Legos. Now, I didn't build this. My good buddy, Charlie Curtis and Scott built this. Uh, I don't have the time to build something like this. I don't have the patience. And I care about Star Wars, not that much. But this is fantastic. I wish you guys could see it in person, the intricacy and the detail. But any one of these individual parts might sit there looking at the architect going, what what, what am I supposed to do? And God goes, I got a much bigger plan going on. If you're willing to lean in to the process of becoming the image of God that's built for you. So when it comes to buying and building a Lego set, let's walk through the process. First of all, when you go to the store, this one retails for about $800. Okay, I think it's about $6 worth of plastic, but it's an $800 build. Eight, so first, when you go to the store, if you want to try to build the life that God wants for you, the, the book of Luke chapter 14, verse 28, Jesus admonishes people, don't start your life until you've counted the cost of following me. He says, what kind of a fool would begin a building process and not count the cost of what it's going to take? So if you go to the store, you want to look at the price tag and go $800. And this took a master Lego builder about 30 hours to build. Like Charlie Curtis, he's all about Legos and he's all about this kind of stuff. He's a massive Star Wars nerd. Took him 30 hours to build this thing. So before you even invest in following God and following the life that he has for you and leaning into his will, you got to first go $800, time, energy, focus? Do I, am I ready to pay that price in order to follow him? Because make no mistake, following Jesus is going to cost you something. It's going to, it's going to mean the the way that you want to do your life is going to change. The way that you spend your money is going to change. Where you spend your time is going to change. The way that you practice your sexuality is going to change for most of us. And in the middle of that, we got to say, am I willing to, 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 be, to be a part of something like this? Am I willing to be part of something bigger and more extravagant? Or do I want to take this and make sense of it myself? I'll be my own. I'm my own creation. Look at me. I'm this big and I get it. Secondly, when you get it, you want to get the box, right? You, get the, you put the box in front of you and you want to fix it on the image. The book of Romans chapter eight says, constantly in our life, we're being transformed and conformed to the image of Jesus in our hearts. Until the day that we die, God is constantly building in us this new life, this new way of living and thinking and doing and being. And every day we're called to look a little bit more like Jesus than the day before. And sometimes that's gonna come through fire and trial and tribulation. And sometimes it comes through success and encouragement and, 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 and moments of clarity and sometimes moments of confusion. But everything is meant to draw us closer to becoming more like Jesus, as Romans chapter eight says. 
So we begin to build this and you always got to keep the box in mind. You look at the instruction manual and you got to keep in mind, this is what it's going to be. Oftentimes, if we don't keep focus on what God is turning us into, then the difficult steps in the middle of our process will just start to quit. Well, what's the point of all this stuff? Psalm 73, this writer named Asaph looks at it and goes, what's the point of all of this? Or, or, or even Solomon in the Old Testament, the wisdom literature says, meaningless. Isn't this all meaningless? Life is just meaningless. But when we fixate on what God is going to eventually turn us into, an image of himself, sometimes it can keep us going. Just like Legos, we want to fixate on the image of what the architect had in mind. Then we got to read the instructions. The booklet to build this thing is hundreds of pages long. And you want to read it and you want to meditate on it and think on it. You don't want to skip. You don't want to skip around and take things out of context. You can't just go to the end of the booklet and go, ah, time to put this piece right here. Done. No, because this right here is not even going to exist. You go step by step. As the book of Psalms says, blessed are those who meditate, dwell on the word of God. Those people are going to be like a tree planted by beautiful streams of water. They're going to yield fruit in season and whatever they're going to do is going to prosper inside the will of God. Then you want to follow the steps. Step one, step two, step three. And this is where the theologian Elsa comes in. With what you know, with godly counsel, with God's instruction manual to us, the life of Jesus showing us how to live and our community around us, admonishing and spurring us on towards love and good deeds, we want to take the next step that we know is the right thing. I don't have to in one day get to the turret system on top. I just got to know today I'm on step four. And if you're coming out of some issue or some addiction or a divorce or whatever, just do what God's calling you to do today. The next step in your process to, to surrendering your life over to what his will and his way is for your life. Then you got to make sure that you trust the architect because there will come a point in your life, just like in a Lego build like this, where the image is not quite reflecting exactly what you think the box is supposed to be and you're frustrated, and you're dilapidated, and you're exhausted. And at one point, I think you just want to grab it by these things. Some nerd's going to tell me what these things are called. The front, the frontal tubulars. <laughs> I don't know. And they're, you're just going to want to swing it against the wall and go, forget it. I'm just going to go back to the 1199 one. I'm going to build it myself and do it my own way. And when that frustration sets in, we can either throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, God, if your will doesn't make sense to me, I'm, I'm not going to walk in it. Or we can say, God, you're building something great through my life. And I'm just going to take the next step of obedience towards you. And then you, you don't want to cut corners. As I found and heard way too much about this week as I was studying Legos, people who cut corners, a lot of these things are built to be in succession for one another. And the certain bricks, it might say, I want a, a, a three-pronged brick right here. And you go, I can't find a three-pronged brick one. So I'll take a shortcut. I'll grab one of my four-pronged brick ones that's twice as, uh, twice as high, and I'll put it on there, and it'll mess up the whole system. You see, the architect has something in mind that he's building very specifically. And to cut corners is to say, I see how you wanted to build it, but maybe I could build it better. And when you cut corners, also what I found out is sometimes you might not see what it messes up until way further down the road where you go to put the last piece on and your double brick makes everything lopsided. So what do you do? When that comes, if you've cut corners, as 2 Timothy 2 says, we're gonna reap the benefits of something. 2 Timothy 2 talks about being a diligent servant, a, 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 a diligent soldier and farmer. And those people are very concerned with doing things the right way. You don't cut corners you got to make sure you do the work well. You finish the mission. You yield the crop. You do everything right so that you are able to yield a harvest that fits inside of God's plan for your life. And then when you mess up, you got to make it right. The conviction of the Holy Spirit on your life when you go sideways is going to say, hey, that peace doesn't go there. Hey, the way that you just treated your wife, that's not going to work. If you want to be built into what I want to build you into, God says, you can't treat people like that. Take it off. Go back, apologize, confess. That's what, that's what the book of 1 John says. 
if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we put a peace out of place, if you've disrespected your parents, if you've disrespected your kids in some way, if you've exacerbated them and you have hurt them, if you've lied, if you've cheated, if you've stolen, go back and make it right because the image that God is building you into is incongruent with the pieces where you're trying to put where God's will is, is meant to be. You go, well, well, this part of God's plan is hard for me. Practicing sex, not having sex before marriage, that's difficult. I'll put my own peace right here. I'm gonna put my own intent right here. God says that's, that's incongruent with my design for your life. And there will be a lopsidedness. There will be an offness until we confess our sins and surrender back over to the Father. Then you're gonna experience the monotony of the piece by piece and day by day where a lot of people go, man, I'm just exhausted or they yearn for something in their life. They go, I wish I, I wish I was back to where I was when I first followed Jesus and I was all excited about everything. But Jesus says, that was great that you were excited in those times. But now we have this deep, meaningful relationship with one another. We've walked through so many hardships and trials and pains and every level of what was being built continue on, even through the monotony of discipline. At some point, we're not gonna be led to follow God by sheer emotion or those moments of great desire but we're gonna have to lean into the discipline of, hey, we're on hour 26 and we're five hours away from this thing. Next piece, next piece, next page, next piece. Why? Because ultimately, as Paul says, you wanna beat your body and make it your slave in order to attain the goal that Christ has laid out before you, which in this life is to do whatever we can to become more like Jesus until the day that we see him face to face and spend eternity with him in heaven. And we got to understand our role in the bigger story. We understand that we are just a small piece to this much bigger Lego set. But then also understand that this is the Millennium Falcon. And this is one part of a whole Star Wars universe. And sure, your life and what your family does and what your community does and what our time in history is looks like this. But this isn't even the full picture. This is just part of something bigger that God's doing, a bigger story God is trying to tell. If someone says, tell me the story of Star Wars, you wouldn't say, no, this is a vessel. This is a vessel by which God is trying to tell a bigger story of redemption, of the good triumphing over the evil, the redemption of people who had turned dark now being brought back to light. As it says in the book of John, Jesus became incarnate, that the darkness surrounded Jesus and didn't understand it, but he came as a light to all mankind. Our role is part of a bigger story that we might not understand, as Isaiah 55 says, his ways are not my ways, nor his thoughts my thoughts. And oftentimes, his plans don't even make sense to me. But I submit to the fact that you're building me into something that might seem extravagant and really big. We might go, God, now it makes sense to me. And God goes, no, no, this, your, your whole church, your whole life, your generation, you might be the Millennium Falcon generation, but I've got a TIE fighter generation, and I've got a Death Star generation, and I've got a, I'm trying to think of all the nerdy Star Wars things that I know, Hoth generation, and they're all gonna tell this bigger story. So don't think that you're the, the bee's knees or the cat's pajamas. You're just one part of something bigger that God's doing. You're actually a part of your bigger generation and your generation is part of a bigger story that God is telling. And lastly, remember that proximity to the architect is more important than your productivity for the architect. One of the best parts of the quarantine is getting to sit down with my son and build stuff like this or getting to play some games of chess with my five-year-old and, and getting to dwell in those moments. I don't care what we're building sometimes. I don't care if it's sometimes there's, there's a mess up or we lost a piece or whatever because sometimes it's just about being with dad and, and about being with son. And God says, I don't want you, I don't want you to follow my, your, my will for your life because I need someone to accomplish these tasks. I need a, a taskmaster to go and do things that I need him to do. I want to build this life with you because I want you to know me and to be known by me as John 17 says. He says, here's my will. Here's what eternal life looks like to know Jesus, to know the father and whom the father has sent, which is Jesus. There's such beauty in just time spent as we walk through this life day by day, struggle by struggle, tripping and falling and stumbling, but God, the architect coming alongside and saying, that peace was out of place, let's walk, let's try that again. That peace was out of place, let's try that again. You're forgiven, you're redeemed, and let's continue to walk through this thing together. Proximity to the Father is more important than productivity for the Father. 
And remember this last thing as we conclude. Everything's already in the box. And now outside of a mistake, God doesn't make mistakes. So when he gives you the box of what he's building for your life or the, the parts necessary for you to play the part that you're gonna be in this, in this story, everything's already in there. God's not saying, well, someday when you achieve this, then you'll finally be ready to accomplish my will for your life. It's already inside. Everything that God wants from you in your life, while it might take a while to be drawn out of you, is already in there. You don't need to wait to start following God's will for your life until you get enough money or, or until you get married or until you have kids or until it's already in the box. God built you and he's commissioned you now. Joseph is 17 years old. A pompous, sarcastic, egotistical 17 year old with a pretty coat when God calls him into service that's, a, that's eventually gonna save his people and be a beacon of light to the world of, of obedience to God. And Joseph's story is telling a bigger story. It's telling the story of Jesus, ultimately. Jesus, who was in very nature God, Philippians 2 says, he took off his robe. Just like Joseph had to take off his robe and he became nothing, he became a servant. Jesus, in the same way, took off his robe of glory in heaven and stepped down into our mess, into our muck and mire and brokenness. He took off everything that he was able to claim. His, he was his father's beloved son. He was his, as the book of John 3 says, God's one and only son, his beloved one. But he took off the robe that his father had given him of majesty and he stepped down into our brokenness and then was eventually sold as a slave and imprisoned for our sin. He was mistreated and he was betrayed. He came to call his brothers to call them into the plan that he had for them, but his brothers betrayed him in the same way. Judas and the other disciples betrayed Jesus. Jesus is betrayed by, the, by those he came to save. Joseph is betrayed in the Old Testament by those that he's eventually gonna end up saving through obedience to him. He's wrongfully convicted. Potiphar's wife came and said, this is what he's done to me in the same way Jesus was wrongfully convicted having these things levied against him. He, he, didn't, he didn't commit blasphemy. He was God. It's not, when you call yourself God and you are, that's not blasphemy, that's truth. And his wrongful conviction put him in a place of imprisonment. But then Jesus stoops even lower than Joseph did. Where Joseph was imprisoned, Jesus was killed and murdered. But then he's exalted to the highest place. He sits at God's right hand in the same way that Joseph was taken out of prison and then sits at the right hand of Pharaoh where he is then able to dole out the grain to the people. God now extends to us the bread of life in himself. His story of forgiveness given to us saying take and eat just like we're gonna be practicing communion this week. Jesus, because of what he's done, he has become the perfect sacrifice and now he extends and invites us in to his kingdom that has storehouses full of grain forevermore in heaven. And in the middle of the story, you might be thinking, how does this, jo imagine Joseph in the middle of the story going, God, how are you in this? But ultimately on the other side, as he sits next to Pharaoh, being able to save his own people, carrying on the plan, the bigger plan that God had for his generation. I wonder if there was a moment that Joseph stood there and went, oh, I get it now. Maybe you're in the middle of a year between jobs, a divorce, loss of a career, hurt, pain, cancer, disease, loss of life, loss of loved ones, loss of something important to you. Or maybe your story just looks like this confusing maze right now. Take heart, beloved, for the architect is building something that is much bigger than your wildest dreams. And what he's building might not make sense to you until you see him face to face. And he turns you around and he says, I want you to look back at what I built. And you go, there I am. Part of your bigger picture for my generation, but part of my generation is a bigger part of your story of redemption, your glory shown to all people. God, in the middle of all this stuff, would you pray with me? Would you please, in the moments where I don't understand my role, would you give me the confidence to trust in the architect, to trust in you, to surrender my plans, to read your book, to read your instructions, and to follow it step by step? so that ultimately I can be made on this side of heaven into the image of Christ as best as I can to walk with you and then ultimately one day to be found in you and to live with you forever in eternity where the storehouses and the grain houses will never end. There will be no more pain, no more death and no more confusion of this path that we're walking in our mortal sinful coil right now. 
Thank you for that promise and thank you for your forgiveness for our sins. Thank you for being the better Joseph. You stooped so much lower and you were exalted so much higher. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. North Coast, we love you guys. Hopefully this was helpful for you. What an awesome visualization of what God is doing in our life and in our generation. We'll see you guys next time. We hope that you were challenged and encouraged by today's message. And as always, we would love to connect with you online. One of the best ways to do that is by filling out a communication card in our digital bulletin. Whether that's a question, a comment, or a prayer request, we'd love to hear from you and we'd love to be praying for you. Stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you next week.